And welcome to the Grid Dynamics webinar, Shaping the Digital Future of Smart Manufacturing. We're so, so delighted that you could all join today. And we are excited to get started with this very special webinar. So um, I, my name is June Bauer, and I'm thrilled to be here with some amazing panelists. And today, what we're going to do is talk to our panelists, who are all experts in uh, not only manufacturing, but the world of digital. And when those two come together, the good things that can happen. So um, I want to go to the next slide, please let you know what we're going to do today. And I am introducing this now. We're going to get uh, intros from our panelists. Then we're going to have a discussion and there will be time for you to ask questions. If you have questions along the way that you want to ask, just go to the Q&A at the bottom of your screen, click that and write your question in. Um, if it makes sense, we'll answer it as we're going along, or we may hold it till the end. But we'd love to hear from you. These webinars are so much better when they're interactive. So please feel free to jot your questions down at any time. Um, we love this to be interactive. So you can put those in the Q&A if you want to add anything to the chat. Of course, you're welcome to do that too. So I want to get started by introducing our panelists and let's go to the next slide here. We've got them here. So let's let's kick it off with uh, Manish. Would you like to introduce yourself, Manish? Hey, everyone. Uh, my name is Manish. Uh, I am Director of Technology at TACIT. Um, we are a part of Grid Dynamics. Uh, in my role uh, in a day-to-day, -day, uh, what I get to do is you know, work with our existing and potential uh, customers on their digital transformation journey, uh, adopting uh, new technologies, um, building new solutions uh, for existing problems or future, uh, uh, work with engineering teams both at uh, client side and um, uh, tacit side and grid side. Uh, so yeah, uh, looking forward to uh, this lovely chat. Fantastic. Well, welcome, Manish. We're so glad you could join. Um, and um, Robert, can you introduce yourself, please? Yes. Uh, my name is Robert Brennan. Uh, I'm the chief engineer for the atomic layer deposition module in uh, Global Foundry's Fab 8 in Malta, New York. Uh, I've been in semiconductors for about 10 years. And before that, I was in the United States Navy working in uh, nuclear power. So I've got quite a good uh, career and background in engineering and technology. And uh, most of my day to day is helping my team understand the information that they're seeing and understand how to apply that to solving engineering and technology problems. So every day uh, it's a new problem. Uh, and I like to joke that every gray hair is a problem I've solved. So depending on uh, your take on that, I'm either very good at my job or I'm just very old. So looking forward to working with you today and answering some of your questions. I love it. Thank you for that wonderful introduction, Robert. And let's ask Ilya to introduce himself. Yep. <laughs> Hello, everyone. Uh, my name is Ilya Katsov. I'm uh, Vice President of Technology at Grid Dynamics. Basically, I'm responsible for uh, our technology practices in different areas, including data engineering, uh, data science, cloud, and so on. And uh, we, of course, work with a number of uh, manufacturing companies across these different areas. And my personal background is uh, mainly in uh, data science and uh, data engineering. So I used to uh, run these uh, this practices for the company for, uh, for a very long time. Well, that's fantastic. Well, welcome to all three of you. As I said, my name is June Bauer and I have been lucky enough to be born and grow up in the Silicon Valley, where I've had the opportunity to work with some amazing technologies and leaders in technology. I first worked at Apple Computer in the very, very early 80s with Steve Jobs and the rest of the rest of the 300 of us uh, building computers, some of the first personal computers, and went on to serve as the vice president of brand marketing at Adobe and the CMO of WebEx and uh, was the CMO at a number of other organizations in the Valley and had have had just the best time learning technologies and working with amazing people. And now I consult full time and I'm working with this awesome group at Grid Dynamics to help them with their webinars. So happy to have all of you here today. Um, I would like to go ahead and get started with you all in our audience by asking you a few questions that will help us in how we tailor our discussion today. So we have a couple polls. Let's bring up the first one, if you would, please. And we'd like you to answer this simple question. Um, click 
any of these that apply to why you're here today. This will help us tailor what we say to you. So today I'm hoping to hear about, and then what smart manufacturing, future trends in smart manufacturing, what types of technologies are trending, how to harness the digital data from the shop floor, how to improve supply chain ops, and how e-commerce plays in manufacturing. So click any of those that apply to what you'd like to learn today. Okay, we've got some good results here. So what we can see is uh, a lot of you want to know what smart manufacturing is. The other trends, absolutely, was the name of the webinar. I would expect that. Uh, looks like our big winner today, though, is what types of technology you're trending. So you must all come from the technology world, and that will be very exciting to talk about. Um, less interest on the shop floor and data there, although I will tell you some things that are happening there are very interesting. We might touch on those, but appreciate that you might not be as interested. And then we've got a few of you interested in supply chain and e-commerce. So that's super helpful. Thank you all for, um, for answering those. We have one more poll, just one more. Um, and uh, let's bring that one up. And this one's more personal about your organization. So we're going to ask you uh, to tell us where you're at right now when it comes to smart manufacturing. And um, just choose one of these that best applies to your company. So too busy to even think about it, just starting to think about it, giving it a try in select areas or adopting it as fast as we can and as in as many areas as possible. So go ahead and choose just one of those, the one that best applies to you. And that'll also help us know where you are in your journey and how to tailor what we say. Somewhat of an even split, but it looks like a lot of you have really gotten a good distance in this journey of starting to use digital, which is really great and really exciting. I guess a, a quarter of you are still thinking, let's say, you know, fewer are just getting started, but we've got a really good mix. So for our panelists, we're going to probably want to think about people at all stages of this amazing journey, but thank you all for filling these out. That'll help us um, with, uh, with what we're going to say today. So let's get this closed and let's jump out of the presentation. If you would help me with that, please. And we'll go to our panelists and our questions. And I want to start with the first question and I'm going to ask all of you to, to give, give us your take on this. And I'm wondering what smart manufacturing and smart factories, you know, we hear those terms a lot and they become really popular in the manufacturing industry. I'd like to get a sense of what they mean to you. So maybe Robert, you can kick us off with your thoughts on that one. So initially, when you're thinking about smart factories, the first thing that comes to mind is an automated factory, like an assembly line for a car. When we look at where we're currently at today, the big thing for smart factories, in my eyes, is semiconductor manufacturing, all right? Those are the fabrication sites where we make the computer chips. And I'm sure most of you have heard that we're in a chip shortage and that the companies are trying to produce these computer chips and get them out. Um, to put that into context, it could take easily 150 to 200 engineers and scientists to make one chip. We call that a technology or a node. So to develop one of them. Um, I will probably never work in the litho department uh, because I'm specialized in ALD. Now, the guy in litho could spend his entire career in litho not working in ALD and not understand how any of my machines function. Part of that is because there's probably 3,000 machines per factory. Each of those machines is probably kicking out 200 sensors, uh, probably at 10 hertz, which is a tremendous amount of data. And all of that data needs to be linked and organized and constructed so that we can identify malfunctions that we may have in the process, a machine that may have an error, or say, you know, the batter in your cake mix, put it into an analogy that maybe some can, can correlate with, isn't up to the, to the stuff that we need it to be at for the cake to be perfect. Um, it could take two to five months to make a computer chip. Uh, typically 800 to 1500 process steps, each of those steps being one tool and each of those tools could be 15 to 30 tools. So smart manufacturing in my eyes is semiconductor manufacturing. We've got it down pat for 30 years and as much of those systems are automated as you can possibly think of. We put new wafers on the line every day. They run to their queues, they run to their uh, factory loops and we monitor the data to make sure that it's sustaining and it's doing what it needs to do. So when I think of smart factories, I think of the industry that I'm working in. 
hope that answers your question. Yeah, I think that's that's really interesting. And I think that thinking about it as a way to connect machines, people, and data is, is a really interesting way to think about it. Um, I'm going to be curious as we go along, you don't have to answer it now, but with, well, now you guys are kind of the leaders in this idea of smart, it sounds like, is what are the next steps for you? What are the things that you can do that are going to take you to the next level? So I'll just I'll just put that out there as a teaser and, and great intro. Thank you for that. It's really great. And Manish, how about you? How do you, you see a lot of clients, you see things across the board. How do you think about these terms? Yeah. So for me, you know, the smart uh, essentially stands for data and interoperability. So you have lots of machines. How do you make them interoperate uh, together and collect the data? Then how do you create insights and actionable items from that, right? So it is the it is that aspect is very interesting. Um, so we always, the manufacturing industry always have been uh, fast in adopting and uh, changing, making decisions uh, faster in the traditional way. Now with the technology available with uh, the advent of you know the cloud technologies and the ability to process any huge amount of data and create actionable items. Uh, it is shifted uh, in a way that the smart has been added into the uh, factory. So it is that smart factory aspect has been uh, coming up very nicely with industry four and such things. So yeah, the, the ability to infer that data and then ability to create that interoperability between all these aspects. You mentioned about human also in that. So it's not only machine, it is about the human uh, factor as well. So yeah, it is, it is that for me, you know, that it is very interesting that, that how that smart using data and interoperability coming into the picture. And are you, Manish, are you, so Robert's in a, in a business and semiconductors where they've been pushing this for, for a while, are you seeing, any companies that are just starting to adopt this or, you know, do you think people are further along? Yeah, so we had a, a, a recent past experience where one of the uh, biggest automobile uh, company uh, in the US, but it is worldwide, uh, they wanted to go uh, direct to consumer, but the, the reason was to learn not only creating a relationship with the consumer, but also to learn from that and take that into the shop floor for demand forecasting and uh, uh, especially around you know the electrical electric vehicle production so everyone is trying to get into that uh, industry so it was an interesting experience where um, how they wanted to use a new additional set of approach even though they can't sell directly to the consumer we uh, figured a way we can talk about that later but we figured a way to do that but that data was then taken into the show, uh, into the factory uh, to uh, demand forecast uh, mm -hmm. better adapt uh, what is uh, what matters for a customer uh, mm. better adapt new technologies or new features, for example. Mm. So take getting new sources of data and then yeah. analyzing and understanding those to influence other processes. Yeah, so reducing that cycle time rather than waiting for the distributors to come and say, this is what uh, the customer is looking for. Uh, you are uh, you know reducing that chain, that cycle and make right. it faster. So even though you can't sell directly, but you can still do things directly with the consumer uh, to, uh, you know, to capture these sort of information. So yeah, these are all, I think the data is becoming the king and, but having data is good, but if you cannot analyze, uh, infer that, and then come up with actionable items, it is of no use. Yeah. How do you know, I mean, they were, this is such an interesting case study, but how did they actually, um, get get the the nuggets the insights out of the data i mean this was new to them right so um yeah so the the key uh, 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 challenge for them was get taking that data and then uh, taking uh, or making it to or taking it to give actionable insights so the the ai ml space which they have to develop so it is still you know been adapting and been developing um, around that, but they have a you know completely different data science team, data engineering team who is uh, helping with the first level uh, data inference and then giving it to. Uh, if you take the demand uh, forecasting as an example, um, it uh, for the electric vehicle when it was being released, uh, it initially the idea was around okay, let's go and build uh, electric vehicles and go and sell it, but then they re realized um, either how do you uh, you know infer the demand so the 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 model was changed to based on the customer sign up the model was changed to a reservation model where okay are you interested uh, mm. and then take that data uh, as an input into the demand forecasting so the 
yes, the companies have to set up a data science, data engineering uh, practice, uh, which uh, um, Ilya can talk about a lot uh, to, you know, to um, uh, take advantage of all this. Mm, very interesting. Thanks for sharing that. It's great to hear that example. Well, well, Ilya, you've just been brought up in this conversation. So let's turn to you and see what you think about smart manufacturing and smart factories. And what does that mean to you? Mm -hmm. Yeah, you know, from my perspective, it actually makes sense to look at it from, uh, you know, like uh, the whole uh, end to end process, because if you think about manufacturing, you know, in general, it basically starts with product design that it goes to, you know, to uh, planning, then to supply, then to production, then to distribution. And actually, like this concept of smart manufacturing, meaning using, you know, this uh, different technologies such as machine learning, such as data-driven uh, decision-making that applies to all these stages of, uh, of manufacturing process, basically. And uh, for different stages, it actually means different things. For example, in, at the design stage, you know, you can uh, assess, for example, your uh, like design risks. You can make corresponding adjustments. You will use certain types of models to do that, to make these decisions and so on, right? And this is very different, for example, for what you do, uh, let's say, in production stage because it's production stage it's more about you know collecting data from machines like for I from IoT sensors uh, doing uh, visual quality you know control developing corresponding models and so on but if we go to let's say uh, uh, distribution uh, it's uh, it's a totally different story right it's about you know price setting and everything and uh, you know in our experience typically uh, you know we do projects uh, around these different stages, around these different buckets, not uh, like smart manufacturing in general. So that's that's my perspective. And of course, you know, I'm, I'm very focused on data aspect of it. There are, of course, different aspects like, uh, you know, uh, machinery and so on, but uh, this is not just, uh, this typically also included in the concept of smart manufacturing, but this is, uh, you know, not, uh, not just my area. Yeah, very interesting. Thank you for that. And I have another question for you just while we're on this topic, which is I'm wondering um, what are the key elements that are really shaping the future of where people are going? We've been talking a bit about what, what, what these things are, but what do you think businesses of the future and operations are going to look like? How is the world going to be different because of this move into digital and smart manufacturing? Uh, well, again, uh, I would I can talk about this like different areas separately because from my perspective it makes more sense, right? If we are talking about uh, like design stage of manufacturing, then I think the biggest transformation is how you assess uh, like your quality of design and your design risks, and this is what we see with uh, quite many companies that are trying to build uh, like smart analytics solutions that uh, do that, and it is uh, generally uh, a very hard problem from my perspective because in order to assess this uh, like design design risks, uh, you need to understand, um, for example, uh, which components can be discontinued going forward, uh, what uh, other potential disruptions related to industry standards and so on. And the forecasting horizon in uh, this exercise, it can be like five to, to 10 years in, in practice. And this is uh, one of the biggest challenges that we are facing uh, in this type of projects is how do we uh, consolidate all the data needed for this analysis and how do we organize like the whole process. And so, you know, there are like whole companies, like vendors who specialized in collecting this data and providing them to uh, manufacturing companies and so on. And uh, I think that uh, it can be, you know, from the business standpoint, companies which implement this capability, they will have a uh, very substantial uh, competitive advantage in this area. Yeah. Then if we are talking about uh, like supply management, uh, supply chain operations, then again, it's, uh, there are a number of changes that are currently uh, goes on, uh, like many companies that invest in building uh, uh, good inventory visibility capabilities so they can see how inventory moves through uh, all the stages of supply chain. Again, they can assess supplier risks uh, and so on. And there are a lot of room for optimization in this space as well. And uh, this is uh, like another important area. And um, probably the biggest challenge, like biggest changes and biggest advantages that we see are in the production stage. In the production stage, um, 
as Robert mentioned, uh, like uh, many companies, even like very large ones, they struggle with uh, data collection because uh, because of multiple reasons. Uh, we can probably can talk about it uh, later on uh, what these reasons specifically are. But um, many companies currently, um, in our experience, they undergo this process of building uh, data collection capabilities, solving these challenges, and once uh, it is. Uh, to some extent, resolved them. There are a number of things that can be uh, built on top of that, uh, including uh, you know predictive maintenance uh, capabilities uh, based on IoT data. This is like, one large area that we see a lot of traction, and another large area is uh, basically visual control. And there are different flavors of it. Like companies, um, for example, they're trying to analyze like camera data to see how like people moving in the facilities and so on detect some like issues and anomalies in these processes. And of course, there are uh, a lot of efforts related to uh, the quality inspection based on, uh, for example, uh, photographs of um, specific produced items uh, with a goal to, defect, uh, to detect defects uh, in that area and so on. And uh, it basically reduces the cost of quality control and uh, improves efficiency of quality control. And uh, um, from my perspective, this will be uh, probably in this area will be like the biggest benefits for manufacturing companies based on, based on what we see. Yeah, really interesting. Thank you for that sharing that. And you know, I just it just made me think about a, an example I heard in the manufacturing world about a, <clears throat> a manufacturer of paper, and they were having real trouble at the beginning of the cycle with um, it, one of the machines producing the first piece of getting the paper together quickly, and so they did an analysis on that machine and they figured out how the paper could be created. I guess they were it was for printing much faster. And so they created this real efficiency, but then what happened was further down the line, all the paper that was coming out quickly now was breaking. And what they hadn't anticipated was the connection between the machines, not just an individual machine um, being much more effective operationally. And it gets very complicated with data when you've got kind of an ecosystem of of machinery on your shop floor that all has to work together. I'm sure, Robert, you know a lot about this because from what you said in the beginning, you know, uh, it's really complicated when it comes to chips. But let's let's turn now to what um, what all of you who are attending today said you were most interested in, and that's the technologies. So I'm interested to know what types of technologies are being used to support smart manufacturing today. And um, maybe some thoughts about what you'd like to see in the future, if you have any of those. And Robert, I'm going to ask you to just kick it off for us here. It's a good question, because it's actually leading into some things that I've been working with for the last couple of years. Um, so robotics is, is big, and robotics is going to allow us to do a lot of uh, heavy automation down the road. You're not going to be able to do it without robotics. Um, what I found out in semiconductors is that the robots is something that everybody wants to play with, but very few people actually understand. Um, so robotics engineering is going to be critical for high volume manufacturing. And it doesn't matter if it's in cars or if it's making paper or computer chips. Robotics will be there and we're going to need to really understand how they function and the components of them. Um, 3D printing is going to be massive. And my professional opinion is that when that gets to a level where it's, it's truly viable to make the components that you need, it's gonna formally reshape the manufacturing industry. Um, we have one situation in one of our factories actually where we needed to buy a new protective cover for one of the automated robots and the, the handling system. Now these robots run on a highway that's built into the roof of the factory. Um, so nobody touches any of the product. The, the, Trucks run up and down these highways, they hover over the tool, they pick up a lot of 25 wafers, they pull it 30 feet up in the ceiling and they take off at you know 20 miles an hour to the next process step. Everything's automated, um, but we can't use the tool if it's not protectively covered. And the supplier of this machine was trying to sell us um, the, entire the entire machine. They wouldn't give us the cover. And they said it was gonna cost, I think $50,000 per component. Um, so, a couple of technicians and engineers sat down and they said, well, we can buy a 3D printer and we could make our own um, for $50,000 plus $2,000 worth of plastic. And that's what they did. And, you know, 
our leadership loved that. So as even in semiconductors, right, where we can't make components and put them into the reactors where the wafers are, but stuff outside of it, we're really starting to take a hard look at 3D printing and what we can do to develop the components that we want. You know, that gives us the independence that we need from certain suppliers and vendors that could be restricting us and gives us the opportunity to maybe develop solutions that would be more successful. Um, and some of the other technologies that I'm seeing used are AR and VR and then AI. Uh, more specifically, AI, we're starting to use, uh, and I mentioned earlier about all of this data that we have, you know, and all these machines, how do we even know what we're looking at? The AI is helping us look for signals that change, and I'm talking within hundreds of milliseconds of a change, but they're helping us see that, you know, when that sensor um, faulted, there were three sensors that, that went high too within 100 milliseconds of that one. We can't see it with our eyes, you can't see it with a human, and the system might not catch it, but the AI is looking at all of this data and it's saying, I don't know if that was something, I don't know if that's correlation um, and causation, but it bumped up, so we should look at that. And that's giving us the tools that we need to go identify and predict failures, and we've already done that with some of our vacuum pumps. We've been able to anticipate when they're going to fail and actively pull them in on time that we can control, not necessarily fault when we have like production running on a machine. Um, the only thing that I can stress is to caution the AR VR. Um, there's a lot of people that, that thought that that was gonna be really applicable to training, uh, to showing people OJT on job training. Um, but in my eyes, you know, solutions to problems stick, right? When everybody can see the good in a solution, they're gonna adhere to but you want to be wary of solutions that are looking for a problem, right? Somebody's got this really cool headset, AR, VR, and they want to develop a solution for it on the floor. Is it needed? What is it going to do for us? Is it actually a solution that's going to solve a problem? And what problem are you trying to solve? So while the AI and 3D printing and robotics is very big in our industry, the AR and VR is kind of taken aside. It may be better for somebody else, but for us, those are the ones that are really starting to take off. Okay, that, that was very interesting. I really appreciate that. And um, we did get a question <coughs> from someone uh, in our audience that was really very much, I think what you just answered, but let me check it out with you and make sure you may have something you wanna add. <coughs> How does 3D printing impact smart factories or is it not up to par for factory lines? But it sounds like from what you said, it's it's up to par and you're using it. But do you want to add anything to that? Uh, I can add a small thing. Um, the Where you're going to print the device and where you're going to use it, you need to just have caution, right? I'm not going to print anything and put it inside of the reactor where it's going to see product. Um, there's huge and immense controls and quality control boards and systems that we put in place for that. You can't just use any bolt that you find off of the shelf, so to speak. But for things that are external to the reactors, like I had mentioned cover plates, or maybe a certain type of bracket, or maybe you want to develop a new type of fixture, by all means, we're starting to use those and move those forward. So it really comes down to the nature of what risk are you willing to take um, with, with the product. So that's going to be up to every industry, to every uh, you know, company, what that is that they're willing to gamble with. So I hope that answers your question. Yeah, no, the, I mean, I thought it was really interesting. I hope our audience is. But if you ask the question and you want more info, just pop something into the Q&A because we're happy to keep going on that. I think it's fascinating. Um, so, Ilya, I know you've worked with a lot of companies across the board and seen many things in regards to technology. From your perspective, what are the technologies you're seeing that are being adopted now? And what do you think is going to be, what does the future hold for the technologies around smart manufacturing? Mm -hmm. Yeah, so we predominantly work, uh, you know, with uh, like data collection and the operationalization of the data insights. So uh, the technologies that I can talk about are predominantly in this area. And, uh, it's actually, but it's, you know, it's entire like world. Uh, it's, uh, it includes uh, actually like multiple things that you need to build because first you need to enable uh, like connectivity from devices and it's typically, you know, some proprietary products that uh, allow to that enable you know like traceability, enable collection of original data from the machines and so on. But then uh, you and what uh, many companies are doing, and this is probably like one of the most uh, interesting uh, like 
technologies or interesting parts in the, this type of solution, in my opinion. Uh, they are building uh, like some sort of microservices platform on edge devices, like in the like in the facilities that are um, able to host multiple different services. And from the data collection standpoint, of course, one of the first services that they uh, they need to build is uh, essentially data consolidation and forwarding service, so that you receive all these events and you forward them typically to some data processing. Uh, systems, uh, it can be in the cloud or something, then a lot of things happening in this area, relatively standard from data processing perspective, they build like data lakes, uh, ML platforms to train models and so on. And then the results of, uh, of whatever they produce, it can be business rules, it can be uh, trained models, they deploy it back to this microservices platform on age and uh, these uh, services, they, uh, in many cases, they're supposed to make real time, near real time decisions, Related to anomaly detection, defect detection, and so on, and they connect it back to uh, to the machines, to the actual controls uh, on the machines to stop uh, uh, production flow, make some uh, some other changes based on uh, based on the uh, received um, data and. Um, um, like uh, from our perspective, uh, there are a lot of interesting things that are happening in, uh, in like best practices uh, around building this microservices platform on age devices specifically. This is, I think, very like, rapidly evolving area. With this data processing area, mail platforms, it of course also evolves, but uh, it's I think it's relatively relatively standard compared to age uh, age technology. Okay, thanks so much for sharing that. And um, Manish, you've been so quiet over there. I don't know if you have any anything you want to add to the technology discussion because I know our audience was interested. I know I'm putting on in the spot a little bit, but if not, uh, no uh, I think Robert and Ilya covered uh, very well. But uh, just one thing to add is um, the concept of digital uh, twin. Um, Robert mentioned about AR, VR in his industry, but I, I, what I you know we see is in various manufacturing world now um, they use the concept of digital twin in a much different way using the real-time analytics data, uh, which powers uh, the near real-time configuration in a virtual product against the physical product. And you can, you know, you can um, test rapidly uh, before even starting a prototype. So just want to add that digital twin. And are you seeing a lot of companies adopting digital twins or is this something that's just starting to happen in your estimation? I think uh, lots of companies have been always doing that, you know, using the traditional card and uh, such things. But now with the uh, real-time data and the real-time configuration being able to power into that and uh, using AR, VR, uh, you know, you are uh, getting more uh, real-life uh, output from those. Mm -hmm. So you are able to make more intelligent decisions and pivot mm -hmm. if needed. Mm -hmm. Yeah, which is great. Okay, yeah, I'm glad you brought up digital twins. I think it's an interesting area for sure. Um, all right, well, thank you for that. And um, let's go to our next question, which is, um, Robert, I'd like to hear from you on this one. So what are some of the challenges that your company, but also if you know of other companies as well, that you think uh, you're encountering in your digital journey and what strategies do you see um, that you're applying to successfully address those? Okay, so there's there's two major things that come to mind on that, and that is data and the systems that use the data. Um, conceptual understanding of the data is very important to me, uh, and I look for that. I look for my engineers and my technicians, even my managers, to be able to really understand what that data means, right? Because you can have a bunch of data, but if it doesn't have context, it doesn't turn into information. You don't know what to do with it. Um, so you say, oh, man, look at all this. We have gigabytes and gigabytes of data from the production line. But if you don't know what it means and how to conceptualize it, you can't interpret it and you're not going to be able to do anything with it. So making sure that people understand the data and know what it means in terms of information at the microscopic and the macroscopic level. So you had touched earlier about the, the, um, the paper plant where they were fine tuning a machine, but then later on it affected another machine down the road. My God, that happens every day in semiconductors. You do um, a change on one machine, right? And there's 1,500 other machines that have a slight effect. You have a slight deviation and then another one and another one, another one, and then 15 tools down the line, you know, we've missed our critical dimensions in our, in our photo mask overlay or something. So it, it happens. You need to kind of understand the, the, the uh, 
macroscopic view of what is this change going to impact? What does this actually mean? Um, and that comes into the, the systems that we work with. Our, I think there's 52 systems currently that, that we have to deal with typically in semiconductors. And if you think about that, most people in Microsoft Office have you know five or six programs. Um, bump that up a couple of notches and that's how many we're dealing with on a day-to-day -day basis. And they have to talk. So we need people that can help us make those systems communicate effectively and to, to uh, know what that information actually entails. And on top of the systems and on top of the data, people have to also communicate and work effectively. Um, I think it was a two or three years ago, I had one fleet, that's what we refer to it as an entire group of machines, one fleet, and there was 35% of the annual time for those production machines were down for particle cases. So that's 35% of the entire year, all right? You know, that's, that's four months out of the entire year that they were down and couldn't run anything. And the, the defect failures, the particle failures, and mind you, these are particles you can't see with your eye. We knew that it was not possible for them to be in the machine. So how do we get out of this? How do we climb out of this hole? So the strategy was a weekly meeting with the team that identifies those defects and with my core ALD team that works on that machine. And what we did was we built an actual library, a, a, a book for them, so to speak, that said, this is how the machine operates. Here's the chemicals that are used. Here's our defect library. Um, and here's how the wafers move throughout the machines and where all of the components are. And at the end of it, I think it was about two, two months after we had finished it, um, one of the, the defect engineers said, I don't know how we never saw this before. And we cut that 35% drop to about 3% in the following year for defect failure. So it's communication, it's understanding what that data actually means and how to turn it into useful information and making sure that the systems, both digital, right, and actual personal all communicate effectively together. That is such a great story. And it sounds like, it sounds like what you're saying is that, you know, it, it is in part the technology, it is in part the people, and it is in part the processes that those people use and put into place. And I, I think that's such an important message because I think as we get excited about all this, you know, new technology and new data and new ways to look at it, that it's only as good as making sure that people are engaged, that they're working together, like you said, with communication and also that they have the right processes. Things will have to change beyond the technology to make it really effective. I think that's what you're saying. Am I right? Yes, correct. Yeah, that's that is such a good. I think that's such a good lesson and so important for all of us to to consider. As much as we love technology and bright shiny objects, there's other things that go into being successful. Um, Ilya, Ilya, let me turn to you on this one and ask you. You know, what do you see across your clients? What's going on out there? Yeah, actually, I can add, uh, like on top of uh, what Robert said, is that uh, like another uh, challenge, like another dimension to it is that uh, many manufacturers, they, uh, in particular in electronics, they use uh, like OEM uh, vendors uh, to whom they essentially delegate some, uh, some operations uh, mm -hmm. in, uh, production of certain products and it actually is very like uh, interesting uh, dimension because especially from uh, the data collection standpoint because these OEM manufacturers they uh, do not always like allow full transparency they do not uh, always provide all the like all the data it's uh, the kind of uh, in some cases it's a kind of negotiation process between uh, uh, like uh, the manufacturer of uh, uh, of electronics and uh, the OEM uh, and OEM companies, and uh, it basically uh, means that in order to even like enable uh, this data collection, they need to identify use cases in some meaningful way, which is uh, difficult to do. They need to prioritize them. They need to um, basically justify the business value of that. Then they need to negotiate uh, the availability of this data with uh, the uh, OEM companies. Uh, they need to figure out how to uh, do it like in technical terms after that. Uh, and it's also challenging because uh, it can be like uh, multiple OEM uh, companies uh, with different standards and so on. So this needs to be like, uh, you know, standardized and, uh, and so on. And only then, uh, 
manufacturer is able to receive this data and do some analysis to it. And this process it takes like a lot of time and uh, a lot of effort even to get this data in a meaningful way and uh, do this data on board. You know, even before we go into uh, you know it's advanced analysis, uh, anomaly detection, predictive maintenance, and uh, whatsoever. And uh, this was um, like in our experience, we worked with at least I think with two major uh, electronics manufacturers, like well-known companies uh, in this area, who uh, which face this problem and uh, uh, they are still the kind of in the process of uh, you know gradual data onboarding and uh, you know in practice it takes uh, quite a long time it can easily take um, you know a couple of years basically this process yeah that's that's great thanks for sharing that very interesting so let me turn now to a different topic which um manish i'm going to ask you about this one which is that um I know that now many manufacturers have been looking at how they can improve their digital commerce if they have been selling, or there may be some um, that you alluded to earlier, there may be some companies that are thinking about maybe going direct to the consumer, cutting out middlemen. Um, How can manufacturers in your mind use digital to improve their e-commerce experience? Yeah, sure. Um, So, you know, we all uh, agree that uh, industrial companies are way behind adopting uh, digitalization, digital commerce, especially digital commerce. Um, uh, c- when you compare against you know traditional retailers or B two C customers, um, so uh, with COVID nineteen, uh, which accelerated you know the adoption of uh, digital services to the to a level which we have not seen. It's very evident that it is important for everyone to now you know look at it. It, it is been um, probably some people are late, some are early because depending on you know the industry vertical. Um, so most um, what I see is most B two B players in this sector are yet to accelerate uh, digitalization efforts or having a strong uh, online uh, presence. A lot of them still doesn't consider uh, that that as an uh, important aspect, but. Um, with what happened last, over the last two years, if some of them are forced to now look at it. Um, so the key thing is, you know, developing a digital um, uh, roadmap. Uh, when doing that, uh, especially in this sector, companies should assess the impact to uh, other channels. Uh, traditionally, offline channel, offline distribution channels uh, was a very big part of uh, this industry. Uh, so the uh, so assessing the impact. Uh, channel conflicts are inevitable uh, because you are creating a new digital uh, channel which can grow, uh, but then uh, you know you should evaluate the potential impacts uh, for other channels. Um, so as an uh, example, uh, company should uh, decide what role distributors are going to play in the new uh, digital uh, channels. Uh, keeping offline and online channels together is normal, but having a strategy for mitigating the conflicts is important. So when I was talking about the um, automobile uh, manufacturer example, um, they want to have a, especially with electric vehicles and the new millennials, uh, people are used to, you know, ordering in a different way than going to a, uh, you know, a dealer negotiating for two days and then coming back home, then going back again. So the new kids uh, want a different way of uh, purchasing. Um, so that was one of the reason uh, to look at it. Um, so then, the you know the regulatory laws in many countries doesn't allow uh, going direct to consumer for some of the manufacturers. Uh, dealership model is very big. So the the kind of approach that the technological advancement allowed them to now uh, create a marketplace where they are exposing dealership stock, and then dealers are in, incentivized more on their commission to adopt uh, the digital channel rather than the physical channel. Um, uh, so and then explaining to the dealers. Uh, you know, the benefit of adopting uh, online versus waiting for somebody to walk into your uh, shop, you know, the lead generation is completely changed. Um, so yeah, the, uh, th- that aspect was uh, very interesting and very successful. So the, um, where a manufacturer who didn't have any direct relationship with the consumer was able to create a, a consumer base, uh, uh, collect their interest, their data, um, not any dodgy data, but the right data, um, uh, uh, and then you know feed that into their demand uh, management process. Uh, create a channel where distributors have a, uh, a system. 
to manage their inventory and uh, it, like um, use the uh, use the online channel more. Uh, the benefits of online channel, so that keeping that distributors in the mix is uh, very important, especially in this sector. And then creating that how the offline and online journey can conflict is a an interesting thing because in the traditional B2C, omni channel is a very big aspect, right? Like we we want to go to a shop, we may have seen something, but we want to uh, uh, come and order online, or we want to add that to basket in our uh, mobile and then go to the shop floor and collect it. So such things are you know already happening for many years in the B2C industry, but that offline online journey, how how can you adapt that in this complex manufacturing world uh, is an interesting aspect also. So yeah, cre creating a digital strategy, a digital roadmap, and then uh, uh, business-led technical roadmap as well to, uh, to go and to do the uh, digitalization. That is very important rather than just technology-led. Business and technology have to work together. Um, and then um, go uh, and then the ability to uh, test and fail, rapid test, pivot if needed. Uh, so these are very important. And um, this example you're talking about, which is really fascinating, it's really interesting the way the business, based on consumer behavior changing, the business needs to change, now the technology needs to change. Um, how did they How did they get this application built? Did they have the right resources internally to do it? Did they have people who learned? How did this process happen? Yeah, so this is where uh, uh, the you know development and upskill of um, the talent comes into picture. But you cannot have all the talent generated within internally in a day or month or even six months. So this is where the right partners uh, comes into the picture. Uh, there are expert partners who can come and help uh, in interesting uh, to solve interesting problems while you can keep the USP internally, uh, you know, so you can have your internal teams work on the uh, certain things with the help of uh, the right partner. Uh, and also the partner can help with accelerating some of these rollouts. So there are uh, partners like, uh, like us grade, uh, we go and, you know, do the digital transformation, uh, we agree a roadmap and then uh, build, uh, right, help with the vendor selection, as an example, help the right, uh, choose the right technology, um, buy was build, uh, shall I build something from scratch or shall I build, buy some SaaS products with the advent of, uh, you know, the, the uh, enhancement of cloud and with the advent of a lot more SaaS products, there is an opportunity to sometimes use certain SaaS product for certain aspects to accelerate the time to market. Um, so it is that, you know, the experts, uh, uh, partners can help in those decision-making, which is very important. Yeah, that's interesting. And I, I, I gather probably there's a lot of companies that are looking for that help as they make that transition to this world of sp smart manufacturing. So that's great to know. Well, let's turn now to another area that's been well, rather stressful for many of us over the past couple of years, I think those in manufacturing, but also those of us just on the consumer side, which is the supply chain. Um, and I know the supply chain has been a huge issue for the past couple of years. I'd love to know if you have any thoughts on how digital can help do a better job of forecasting and managing supply chain issues. Is there anything that's on your mind? And Ilya, I'm going to ask you to kick it off there on that one. Uh, well, I think it's uh, ironically enough, uh, you know, this uh, like pandemics, it has, uh, in my opinion, quite positive impact on how, you know, companies manage their supply chains, because they started to think more about uh, resilience of supply chain, they started to invest more in the, uh, things that uh, they ultimately would develop uh, without pandemics, but it just accelerated this process, like, you know, inventory visibility, uh, you know, advanced demand forecasting techniques and so on. And uh, I think that uh, over the last uh, like couple of years, uh, like investments in these areas, they uh, were increased significantly and uh, it uh, generally had positive effects on both resilience and efficiency of uh, supply chain management. And uh, many of these uh, capabilities, they are not specific to uh, like pandemic uh, impact, they, uh, as I as I just said, uh, in my opinion, they would be developed anyways. Maybe it would take longer before pandemics. But um, in addition to that, I think interesting aspect is that uh, there were some changes that were like really specific to uh, the impact of, um, of uh, like lockdowns and other disruptions uh, that um, 
in particular, it uh, relates, of course, to demand forecasting because uh, you know when you have such major disruptions as pandemics, then uh, you basically cannot uh, rely on. Uh, your uh, standard uh, demand forecasting techniques and uh, what we've seen is that uh, even in very like early stages uh, of pandemics it was realized by many companies that uh, will be uh, like major disruptions will be initially lockdowns and reopenings and so on and um, um, quite many companies they started in very early stages to make adjustments to their forecasting techniques basically uh, it was uh, you know initially the kind of like guesswork but um, uh, typically, the idea was to incorporate additional data sources, like the number of you know COVID cases, information about lockdowns, uh, like community mobility records, you know how people are moving. Uh, also, try to extrapolate uh, this data using some historical major disruptions, like the economic crisis of 2008, and so on. And based on you know this analysis. Um, make adjustments to uh, the forecasts and uh, then make adjustments to the uh, uh, production and distribution plans. This was uh, quite an interesting uh, aspect. Uh, it was, uh, you know, very, uh, in most cases, it was very challenging to uh, like implement it right from, uh, you know, analytics perspective. But uh, one interesting lesson that we learned based on that is that, uh, you know, in such situations, it probably does not make sense to like, perceive and pursue high accuracy of this forecast, but it's more uh, important to produce more like directional uh, guidance to the companies based on these uh, like, economic factors and comparison with historical disruptions, which is uh, generally helpful. Yeah, that's interesting. So thinking about other sources of data that you have access to that you could combine with the data you have and then use AI to understand what that means and what what next best action might be there for you. I think it's very interesting to think about. So um, Manish, I know you've had experience with supply chain as well. Is there anything you want to add? Yeah, just uh, on top of that, you know, the, um, the many companies have spent so much money early on on supply chain, but the technology stopped innovating, uh, especially on you know, transformative capabilities, which is like ability to link and combine cross-functional data, which uh, Ilya was talking about, you know, example, inventory shipments schedules. If you combine everything together, you will be able to solve a, a problem. But if you have it uh, individually, it is of no use, right? And then the other is um, forecasting demand and performance based on advanced uh, analytics, uh, which could, you know, give you some precise planning, which can avoid uh, or uh, like uh, some uh, problems can be anticipated early um, uh, using the analytics. So, um, yeah, it is uh, also just looking at technology alone uh, may not be a solution. You know, it is technology and operational processes work hand in hand. So both have to be ad adopted. So just changing processes may not help if you don't have the right technology, like, you know, ability to link and combine the data and just putting in technology without changing the operational process uh, may also not help. So they have to work hand in hand. Very pragmatic advice. Thank you for that. Um, well, you know what is amazing? Um, I have learned a lot today. I hope our audience has too. It's been so interesting to hear from all of you, hear your examples, uh, get excited about new technologies, but also understand that te technologies are only as good as the people and the processes that work together to realize them as part of solving a real business problem. So that's kind of what I got out of it. And I loved it. And I love what's happening in manufacturing. It's an exciting and revolutionary time for many of you. And for many of you, you're just starting to see how the things you've been doing for many years, that being Robert and Global Foundries, um, is just starting to be adopted and used by other companies. So I think that's great. I want to thank all of you so much for joining today. We appreciate you taking the time out of your really busy schedules to be a part of our webinars at Grid Dynamics. And I really would love to see you again sometime in the near future. We'll be offering more webinars. But in the meantime, I want to thank our panelists so much for being here and sharing their thoughts. It's been fantastic to learn from you. Great to have you as an audience join us. And um, you all go out and have a great rest of your day. And hopefully we'll see you soon in the future. Bye-bye.